brick by brick, wall by wall, Zionism will fall. Brick by brick, wall by wall, Zionism will fall. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. Make some noise. Hi everyone, thank you so much. My name is Youssef, I'm an organizer with the Palestinian Youth Movement. Thank you so much. Um, and first and foremost, uh, thank you to the Party for uh, Socialism and Liberation for helping us arrange this talk. And thank you to Richard Becker for joining us today, the author of Palestine, Israel, and U.S. Empire. An essential book for the current moment that takes a firm anti-Zionist stance. Uh, on the history of Palestine and Israel and traces the movements of resistance from British colonialism to the fight in Gaza and the West Bank today. It also looks at the division of the Middle East by Western powers and the Zionist settler movement to the founding of Israel and its role as a watchdog for U.S. interests. Um, to present uh, conflicts and the prospects for a just resolution, this narrative is firmly rooted in the politics of Palestinian liberation and also contains a complete index and timeline of developments in the history of Palestine. Thank you so much, Richard, for joining us today. If you want to give people a little background about yourself. and Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, My name is Richard Becker. Before I say anything else, I, I would really urge people to read the book Trinity of Fundamentals. It's really something. It's a, a unique book. When I when I started reading it, I couldn't stop. I read 190 pages all in one sitting because it's such a compelling book. And it's such, it's such a, a gift to the, to the movement that PYM has translated it and all the work that's gone in to making it now available uh, t after 25 years to people who uh, do not read Arabic. So uh, I've, <clears throat> I've been involved in the solidarity movement since the early 1980s. Uh, and have had the privilege, and it's a real privilege and it's a hard one to come by now, to travel to Palestine on a number of occasions, and also to other countries in the Arab world which have been the victims and still are the victims of U.S. imperialism. So our book <clears throat> uh, is one that uh, first was first published in 2009. Uh, it has been updated and was republished just a couple months ago, and it, it uh, has been published uh, in this country and we're, uh, we anticipate it will also be translated and published in other countries as well. And so, thank you all for being here. This is so inspiring to see. It's, you know, it's, I think that those in power thought that when they came down on Colombia, that that would be it. And instead, it has inspired people all across the country, especially in the universities, to take action like the action that's been taken here today. We salute you. Thank you so much, Richard. So indeed, we will also be talking about the Trinity Fundamentals, another 1804 publication. Um, we, the Palestinian Youth Movement, translated and published the novel um, in partnership with 1804 books from uh, Arabic to English. Um, and it's authored by Palestinian revolutionary and former uh, political prisoner, Wissam Rafidi. Um, Wissam wrote it, wrote it when he was uh, imprisoned in Zionist prison in 1993. However, during his imprisonment at al Nakab prison in occupied Palestine, the book was confiscated by prison guards. Um, but with the help of his comrades, uh, he was able to smuggle it, smuggle it out to share uh, with the world using tablets. Um, in fact, it was written in a stream of consciousness style, and one of uh, Wissam's comrades was able to uh, uh, r recount the the uh, the novel and s uh, smuggle it out of the prisons using these tablets, which is really a really remarkable feat. There's a long history of uh, Palestinians resisting in Zionist jails and prisons, another important site of struggle, and we firmly believe that Palestinian prisoners are the compass of our struggle. Uh, So yeah, we're incredibly grateful um, and fortunate to have this book with us, um, this important work of literature and political commentary in our hands. Um, 
And with the help of the text of Richard and Wissam, we would like to discuss the role of students and political prisoners uh, and what role they play in the liberation of Palestine and what lessons these books have for us to offer. Um, and first, I'll talk a little bit more about Trinity, and I want to begin with a quote that Wissam uh, says. So he says, when a human being is fighting for his life, as he sees it, with a deeply rooted determination and conviction in the justice and legitimacy of the cause for which he is fighting, he is transformed into a distinct being in his strength and his conduct. And I, will, I would like to say that our students leading the encampment today in solidarity with Gaza are ins inspired by the steadfastness of the Palestinian people and guided by a political objective are truly embodying, embodying the spirit of Wissam's words. And they have shown us strength and conviction. And as you said, Richard, we salute everyone in the camp for their strength and convi conviction which inspires us today in this encampment of our own here. So the war and genocide in Gaza has really revealed one of the most significant contradictions to the entire world. The political class, the corporations, the reactionary parties, and all types of elite institutions, including universities, are conspiring, as they have for decades, to destroy a people that continue to be at the forefront of the battle against imperialism. More importantly, this genocide has also revealed to Palestinians and to Arabs and to the masses more broadly that through organization, collective sacrifice and protracted confrontation, we can undermine imperialist Zionist ideology and widen the cracks in its public image. An imperialist ideology that is manufactured and exported by universities like GW and the consortium of DC universities here, which are actively complicit in the occupation, colonization, and ethnic cleansing of Palestine through their endowments, investments, and academic partnerships. Shame! 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 Shame. This political moment is significant and powerful. The SJPs are inspiring people across this country to be a part of this unprecedented moment and movement. How can we, uh, how can we embolden people to increase their capacity for individual sacrifice, the sacrifice that we see now and are inspired by? How are revolutions built and sustained? What is the importance of knowledge production in times of war and revolution, especially in these sort of settings where universities aren't here and the pub and education systems in this country aren't meant to, to, make, uh, to make thinkers, but rather workers? How do we combat that? These are questions that we Sam's novel really challenges to confront and inspire us to answer. The novel popularizes Palestinian history of the first intifada in the late 1980s and early 1990s through a first-person account that allows us to understand what it means to be committed in a political project and what it means to make a personal sacrifice in service of a collective struggle and the collective good. The themes are intensified in this political moment, given the context of what's happening in Gaza and Palestine, but far surpass this moment, and it's our duty, our revolutionary duty, to use this moment to engage people on the importance of organization and collective sacrifice in the struggle for justice. The story in uh, Trinity of Fundamentals is actually inspired by Wissam's real life experience documenting the protagonist, uh, Kanan, uh, and his nine years of hiding from the Zionist occupation. Nine years of hiding in the Zionist occupation, during which time he organized and actively struggled against it. Love, revolution, and life are the trinity of fundamentals that pave Canaan's struggle forward. And some of the themes explored in the novel include the impact that sacrifice, um, revolutionary sacrifice have on personal relationships and the inner self. The role of students in the university in the Palestinian liberation struggle, as well as different entry points to political organizing, and the impact that has on the long-term commitment and discipline of organizers. In fact, universities are the convergence of different segments of Palestinian society in one place. The villages, the cities, the factions, and provide a space for uh, people to exchange ideas. And we're seeing that here in the space that's been created, this popular university here is really an embodiment and a reflection of what our people in Palestine are doing. Wissam also describes the political commitment that characterizes the behavior of students and the most important type of commitment in this regard is deeply rooted in ideological and political conviction. How literature, study, and political education really play a nourishing role for organizers and revolutionaries and guide us in pursuit of our noble cause. And lastly, how steadfastness is absolutely essential. In fact, despite his life of secrecy, 
Wissam considers his confinement as liberated territory. He realizes that his sacrifice is a personal choice that can only be achieved by affirming commitment to the struggle, the fundamentals of life that our oppressors seek to withhold us from. Our prisoners, our people in confinement actively struggling against the Zionist entity, make sacrifices and their sites of struggle uh, where they're fighting for the basic necessities of life. Right? The Zionist occupation seeks to dehumanize us, seeks to uh, deprive us of these things that are essential, but nevertheless they cannot break our spirit or our will. Um, he even says the revolutionary is about swimming against the tide and not making peace with the current state of affairs. And we're really seeing that today through this encampment, through this popular university. And we Sam, uh, you know, you know, it really means surrounding yourselves with comrades who, you know, also shed or renew their skin as well as committing to a culture of study which will naturally cleanse yourself and your inner self. So it's important that we sustain our efforts here today and moving forward. The struggle is a long-term struggle and we are, same way that generations past laid down the work, we are now continuing that, standing on their shoulders and continuing to build so that future generations may see a liberated Palestine. And I'd like to conclude, uh, you know, this uh, kind of um, overview of the novel with a quote from, from the book. So Canaan says, But is revolution anything other than an act of madness and risk-taking? A struggle that is serious and deep-rooted in nature requires living the life of resistance passionately, living the revolution madly. A revolutionary plays a very high price to realize an idea. Just an idea. Canaan had paid to realize his idea, vision of the revolution and his adventure. To live life madly was to storm through its tests, difficulties and adventures. The experience of life molds and teaches. It shakes off ap apathy and laziness and silly routine. It provides the know-how and experience to dr dive into another experience so as to be molded and educated anew. Life was to be lived passionately by invading it and subjugating it through the madness of diving into the sea of new experiences, which is its novelty and strangeness changes us, giving us permission to ride upon its sea and subdue it. He saw his experience, his secret life, in this way, a mad experience that ground him, mixed him with the water and needed him anew. He swam in the sea of life and learned from it. He lived it with all his strength for struggle required that of him. And I'd just like to also say that, you know, I think there's so much that um, we can take from this novel, from the lessons in it. Um, and truly, the students today are embodying it. They are embodying it through the sacrifice that they're making. Yeah, round of applause. And we have changed the equation of student organizing. We see the level that we are willing to go to, not only as students, but as a community who supports the student movement to advance our noble cause. And the universities are afraid, and rightfully so. Why? Because there's so much capacity for change. We've seen it throughout history, and truly the lessons that we have from the novel, I think will help sustain us and carry us forward. And if anyone would like to discuss uh, um, after this uh, book talk, you know, to learn more about the novel and kind of its themes and everything, I'd be happy to. But now I'd like to toss it back to Richard to talk about his book, which has a very useful analysis and framing and looking at the Palestinian struggle and the way that Zionism, uh, it, we must look at it from a settler colonial framework and as uh, an anti-imperialist framework. Um, so, uh, Richard, uh, we would love to hear a little bit more about, about the book. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I wanted to say at the beginning that we wrote this book in 2009, and it was updated in the last few months, and a lot of the work that was done in it, the chronology, the end notes, which are very valuable, uh, the preface by PYM, uh, and uh, the work that was done by my comrades in the Party for Socialism and Liberation meant that this is really a collective effort. My name is on there. I wish there were other names on there too, but the publisher decides. Uh, so this book was, is really meant to be a resource for activists. It's meant to show, uh, to demystify this, many myths that have surrounded this issue, this struggle, and to show that uh, what the intention was 
of the organizers of the Zionist movement what their intention was from the very beginning in their own words. And I think that that's what makes it such a useful, a, a useful for, uh, instrument for the movement. So I just want to talk about what some of the main themes are, which I think have continuity from the beginning of the Zionist movement and, down till, and resonate down till today. That at the beginning, it was on the one hand, the Zionist movement, a reaction to very real anti-Semitism uh, in much of Europe and the United States. Uh, but at the same time, it was from the very beginning a European colonial movement. And how do we know that? They said so. Uh, they said so themselves. We are a colonial project. And they were a colonial project that like all the colonizing projects, including the one that came here, had no respect at all for the rights of the indigenous people. And how do we know that? Because their favorite slogan was a land without a people for a people without a land. They did not consider the indigenous people of Palestine to have any rights that they were bound to respect. Shame. Shame. It was a there, so there was that contradiction, and there was another contradiction which resonates right down to today, and that is that while it was an aspirational colonial movement, it had no army, it had no navy. It could not be, and you cannot be, a colonizing movement unless you have at your disposal the, the, uh, uh, the forces of violence that are necessary to compel an indigenous people to surrender their land. They're not going to do it voluntarily, of course. So what did this mean? It meant for the Zionist movement that it would spend its first 20 years after its founding in 1897, its first 20 years searching for a sponsor. They went to the Russian Empire, the home of the worst pogroms uh, and the worst anti-Semitism. It included Poland at the time. They went to the German Empire. They went to the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire was the ruler over Palestine and Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and Egypt at that time. And they went to the British Empire. And it was the British Empire that became their sponsor with the Balfour Declaration. How many people know what the Balfour Declaration is? A lot of people. This has been a very educational six months, I would say. Uh, so, you know, they, uh, the British agreed really at that point, at a time when they did not control Palestine. They were giving away something that they didn't own and shouldn't own and had no right to own uh, to, to, uh, to a col another European colonial power. And at that time is also the infamous Sykes-Picot Treaty that cut up the Ottoman Empire uh, to, to, and colonized the Arab people and the other peoples of that region by the British and by the French. Since 1948 and, the, and the, uh, the massacres that took place, the Nakba that took place, uh, the, the uh, British left. And the British left, and who came in to replace them? At first it was not so much the United States, it was France, imperialist France, replaced imperialist Britain. Up until the time of the 1967 war, when the number one imperialist, the United States, became the sponsor. So I say, I say this because that is true down till today and the state of Israel, the Zionist movement and the state of Israel could not have functioned, could not have gone anywhere without the sponsorship of one of the great imperialist powers and by great we mean great in their violence. So that was true. And another one uh, is today you know we chant Israel is a terrorist state. Israel was born a terrorist state. It could not have been born otherwise. It was only by means. It was only by means of terror that the Palestinian population, 750,000 to 800,000 people, were forced out of their homeland. They could not and would not have left otherwise. So we have that continuity, that continuity that continues to today, and the land hungriness of the Zionist movement has been what has driven them. So they, the, the desire for land led Israel, once it was formed, to become a, war, a warfare state. It was a warfare state at the beginning in 1948, 49, 
It went to war with the British and the French against Egypt in 1956. It conquered the West Bank and Gaza and Golan and Sinai and East Jerusalem in 1967. They invaded and conquered part of Lebanon until they were driven out by the Lebanese resistance in the year 2000. So it's been war after war after war. It's like the Sparta of the Middle East, you could call it. A, war, a state built on, on, on war and has been built on war ever since. Why does it, one, two other things I want to mention that we aim for in the book. One is to talk about why does the U.S. do this? Why does the U.S. give billions of dollars a year and now they just appropriated how much more? 26 billion more? This is a, Israel is a country with a middle, with a Western European standard of living for much of its citizens. You know, they have health care, they have, you know, education and so forth. Why is all this, why is all this wealth poured into the state of Israel? It's because Israel is an essential element from the point of view of Washington, not of a party that shares values or anything like that, but as a giant military base part of the U.S. global empire, where there are 800 military bases, but although Israel is a small country, it's a very large military base, and it's one that's very hard to dislodge, but someday it will be dislodged. And the last thing I want to say, and it's connected uh, very much to the book, uh, The Trinity of Fundamentals, and that is there's a word I think that a lot of people have learned, an Arabic word, sumud, and it means steadfastness. And it's a word that really encapsulates the struggle of the Palestinian people who have been counted out over and over and over again. In 48, when the name Palestine began being taken off the maps of the world, to what happened in 1967 and the conquest of the rest of Palestine by Israel, to what happened in Jordan in 1970, what happened to Lebanon in 1982, and all the wars that have taken place against Gaza, all the repression that takes place against the Palestinian people in the West Bank, the horrors that are going on today under the fascists and the Israeli government who are in charge of the prisons, the torture, the abuse that's going on. And yet the Palestinians have been steadfast. And they have been steadfast, and today, Palestine is at the center of world politics. After being counted out so many times, the center of world politics. So let us, let us take a page from that great book of steadfastness and be steadfast ourselves and continue in this struggle until Palestine is truly free. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, there was uh, there was uh, one bit that you had mentioned regarding, you know, how Israel was the benef uh, you know, its benefactor was the uh, or patron was the uh, the British Empire and then the the American Empire, um, and something that you know, in looking at the way the the U.S. supports Israel today, you know, got me thinking how you know the universities here have you know. The investments and the, the academic partnerships with uh, with you know the the Zionist entity, and you know we know why the U.S. supports Israel, right? It's it's uh, it's a outpost of imperialism for controlling the region, for exploiting uh, its uh, its people and extracting its uh, resources, um, and you know, kind of what's the parallel here on universities? You know, we look at the universities. Why do they have uh, these relationships and then one thing we can look at is you know that we kind of touched upon earlier is that you know universities will oftentimes say you know this is a space for people to express their ideas for free speech for people to exchange ideas and everything but now we see how they crack down when we do that so why right because we see how these universities especially here in DC are meant to create these agents of imperialism right and what we're doing here today is in this uh, these last several days and will continue to do moving forward is show that this is not acceptable and that we are going to push back and resist against this until the demands of the student movement are met um, and it's really important you know to, to really see those connections between 
imperialism and you know education and you know it, re it really underscores why political education and popular education is important um, which leads me you know I have a couple of questions one uh, is um, you know what are some other maybe key insights from the book or maybe you know from uh, you know you know important um, works of uh, um, analysis in general that you think would be really essential for us in this current moment um, and you know how can it uh, energize us uh, moving forward this is a good question uh, <laughs> You know, uh, one thing I should add uh, that's, that's there that I haven't mentioned is there's a number of appendices uh, to the book. And one of them is called Israel Base of Western Imperialism. And it was written by, in 1968, by Abdel Wahab al-Masiri, who was an Egyptian historian, or a really great historian. And <clears throat> he explains how, it, which I think is an important point, why Israel is, uh, it, it has uh, a particular relationship, and at that time, this is a long time ago, it's at a time when Rhodesia was still Rhodesia, called Rhodesia, not Zimbabwe. It wasn't liberated yet. South Africa was still, the apartheid system was full force. And those were the friends. Those were the friends of Israel in the 1960s. When decolonization was happening in the world, Israel was befriending them. In 1979, uh, a little after he wrote this pamphlet, you know, Israel uh, gave uh, South Africa the atomic bomb, the way that the French had given Israel the atomic bomb in the late 50s, early 60s. And why did they do that? They did that beca because uh, Israel was following the U.S. lead. They wanted South Africa to have the atomic bomb because South Africa had the role of patrolling sub-Saharan Africa the way that Israel has the role of patrolling uh, the, the, the Middle East. I'm, they were part of the same in, uh, imperialist framework. You know, there's a very interesting, at the end of it, uh, he says to a student, he, um, El Masiri was teaching at Rutgers in 1968, and he says to a student, why is Israel supporting the U.S. in Vietnam? The Vietnam War was at its height. And the student who was from what was called the Peace Party, I don't think they have any peace parties anymore, uh, but the, or even pretending, you know. Uh, the, but he says, Israel must defend itself, <clears throat> which is worth thinking about a little. Might not jump out right away, but it's like, was Vietnam about to attack Israel? I don't think so. Uh, the, you know, they were waging their liberation movement. But what it really was an expression of, on the part of someone from, uh, the moderate wing in, in Israel is the idea that they had to be in lockstep with U.S. imperialism in order to be able to continue as a state. So I would suggest, you know, if, if you do have a chance to, to see the book, that's a really, really powerful uh, piece that, that's included in it. And the other part about that, uh, just say, to say for a minute, is that he shows how the Israeli leaders, the Zionist leaders and then the Israeli leaders, over and over and over again said to the effect, we are from the Occident, not the Orient. And they hated the, uh, uh, what was called at the time the Third World. They wanted no part, of, they wanted not to be any part of it. So it's because they are not any part of it and because they are a colonial implantation in a part of the world that is hostile to them, that they're so valuable to the U.S. You know, I mean, like in Bahrain, which had the Abraham Accords, you know, signed the Abraham Accords with Israel, and that was supposed to be a great thing. Uh, if the people of Bahrain could escape from the control of, the di of that brutal dictatorship, they would overthrow the government of Bahrain and they would cancel the Abraham Accords. And from the point of view of Washington, that means they are unstable. They don't consider Israel unstable. They consider Israel an extremely reliable partner in their strategy of global domination. Thank you so much. Um, because we're coming a little bit close to time, I want to make sure that I, uh, at, you know, 
open it up for questions. But before I do that, I have a question to post to everyone here in the audience. Um, and we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but I really want to know what people here think. Um, and that is, uh, you know, why is political education important? Why is, uh, why is collective study important? Why is it important that we, you know, have these spaces for each other to discuss, you know, these kind of books and, you know, these kind of analyses and frameworks? What, what is the purpose of it? Why, you know, fundamentally, why is it that we do this? Uh, yes, uh, pro uh, propaganda, right? We see uh, there's a lot of propaganda in the media, there's propaganda at universities, there's propaganda that uphold these systems of oppression, and one of the weapons against pro uh, this uh, this type of propaganda is, you know, uh, political education and the type of propaganda that can uh, push back the, the truth that can push back against these uh, these uh, lies that are are fed to us, including in academic settings. Anybody else? So history doesn't repeat itself. Good. I guess because uh, six months ago this occupation was possible and yet it didn't happen, and that one of the reasons that it did happen just now is that, as you say, six months later people know what the Balfour Declaration is, know the history of the State of Israel, and that motivated some of these students to come out here with the fervor that they did and the steadfastness that they did to know they were on the right side of history. Certainly. We're seeing so many contradictions sharpen. We're so, seeing so many people get uh, politicized and radicalized and not just that involved actively involved in the struggle for liberation and the broader struggle against imperialism and colonialism um, you know not making the same mistakes from history learning from history um, it's important to learn from previous generations what worked and what dif didn't work right and now we have the benefit of technology and leveraging that in a way that we can document these things and share these things in uh, s speeds that we could have never before imagined in, in the past. Um, and it's also about unlearning, you know, these oppressive uh, imperial and colonial narratives. And by understanding our history, contextualizing the present and carrying the struggle forward, um, you know, we develop the tools, right, the tools to fight these systems of oppression. Um, you know, there's a, there's a relationship between, uh, you know, uh, theory and praxis, right? Where through these experiences we develop ideas and also through the development of ideas we inform the actions that we uh, take to fight back against uh, these systems of repressions, including the repressions that we see on campus. Um, and before we close, I just want to open it up to, uh, maybe we can take one or more two questions if people have any, any questions about the, the books or anything that we've discussed about today. Uh, so just so for folks in the back who might not have heard, the question was uh, like in short about uh, the geopolitics uh, that we're witnessing now and kind of how the events of the last like six, seven months have, you know, we've, we've witnessed a lot of um, developments in that arena. Well, it's a big question. It's a very big question, but I, I would just say a couple of things about it. One is the main focus of U.S foreign policy, imperialist foreign policy, is shifting to China. It's shifting from West Asia to East Asia. Uh, and they're preparing for war with China, which can mean catastrophe, of course, for humanity. But it's exactly for that reason that Israel, in a certain way, takes on greater importance because West Asia, the Middle East, North Africa is still very important. So if the U.S. is shifting, 
This is the, you know, way back when the Nixon doctrine was Israel and Iran should patrol the Middle East for the sake of the U.S. Well, Iran, of course, had the revolution and that, that was over. But still, they, they have to think about this, about, you know, what... And so Israel remains extremely invaluable and irreplaceable from the point of view of domination of the Middle, of the Middle East. At the same time, there's a contradiction between the U.S. and Israel, even though it doesn't seem like it now. One is that the Israelis want land. They're seeking more land. They're seeking land right now. They want to take more of Lebanon again. They want to, you know, as Jared Kushner, you all know him, said Gaza would make a nice waterfront area. You know, they, so there's that. They want land. They want, and the U.S. doesn't really, the U.S. leaders don't really care that much about Israel and land. What they're doing is managing an empire. And if, what Israel is doing, though, is making it harder for them to manage their empire because it's so, there's such great anger toward what Israel is doing and what the U.S. is doing as the backer of Israel, as everybody in the world who's paying attention now knows. So, just a very partial answer. Thank you. And I think we can take one more question from the audience. Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah, uh, Genocide Joe. It's, uh, I think he thought, you know, back on October 7th that this would, his position of all out support for Israel would clinch him the presidency the next time around. That everyone would rally around him, you know, the, lead, the, the ruling elite would rally around him and instead it's, it's caused a serious split in the Democratic Party and has shown at the same time that the Democratic Party, like the Republican Party, is an imperial, that they're both imperialist policies. So uh, what's happened, you know, and when I say that Palestine is today the center of world politics, it's, it's meaning that it's having ramifications all over the world, including in the election here in the United States, but all over the world, it's dividing people. And the movement that has developed, I think, has a, a radicalness to it. It's not just uh, opposing, although that's first and foremost, what the U.S. is doing and standing in solidarity with the Palestinians, but I think it's a revolt against the system itself. And that revolt has emerged because of what happened and what, uh, what happened in October, what happened on October 7th and everything that followed it. It has become the center of world politics, and it's, imp it's impacting all over the world. And, and of course, just look around here. Would we have been here uh, without what, what's happened there? You know, it, it really, it, it's, it's really a, a tremendous development that's taken place, and there are many, many more ramifications that we don't know of to come. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add to that, um, it, it also kind of touches upon uh, on this response, but essentially we're seeing the, the political elites in this country uh, be exposed, right? And we see them on the back foot as well, um, that, you know, this uh, two-party system that we have here is, is merely a facade. They are, they're both imperialist parties with imperialist interests and they align with that of those in Israel whether it's a so-called moderate party in Israel which doesn't exist there's no moderate they're all um, they're all reactionary or when it comes to the more explicitly and overtly right-wing elements in Israel they're all aligned on uh, their politics and their uh, their their shared interests and agenda um, and then another thing to kind of build on is that Palestine is you know why are so many people inspired by it is because it does serve as a compass of you know anti-imperial resistance and anti-colonial resistance uh, people are really inspired by the way that despite seven nearly 76 years of oppression of ethnic cleansing of uh, of dispossession and displacement and now of genocide that 
we continue to fight back, we continue to stay strong and firm, and that we will not give up in pursuit of our legitimate rights, which is self-determination, a liberated Palestine, which is an end to the Zionist occupation and the right of return for all Palestinian refugees. And one thing that I really want to end with all of you guys today is that it's not a matter of if Palestine is going to be free, it's a matter of when. And right now... Right now, this moment is a very important moment and step in that direction. And we have all important roles to play here in the diaspora where the financing and the political, uh, the political um, legitimacy is uh, given to the Zionist entity. So we have an important role here to play, to fight back, to, to sharpen these contradictions and to show that, you know, that the masses, not just here but across the world, do not accept what's happening in Palestine and that we will fight and we will continue and we will persist until we have liberation from the river to the sea. And thank you, Richard, so much. And thank you all of you for coming out today. From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Make some noise! Stay tuned for some additional updates. We'll have some, uh, some uh, more info regarding today's programming. And again, thank you so much, guys, for coming out today.